Happy Monday, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another Planetarium live stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station. And thanks for joining us. Uh, if you're here for the first time, then welcome. Uh, we've been streaming live every Monday night for the past uh, six, seven, eight months, uh, 27 years, who knows. Uh, this year has been crazy, but we've been streaming and we've covered a lot of really fun topics. So uh, don't forget that we upload all of our streams to YouTube. So if you miss any of our past streams and you can check all those out, uh, just search for the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium there. Uh, and if you're a returning watcher, then welcome back. I know we have some uh, longtime watchers in the audience. Uh, and as a reminder, this is a live stream. So I'm coming to you live uh, from the pocket dimension located inside my apartment in Kansas City. Uh, and if you are watching, then say hi, uh, pop a comment in the comment section. And let us know where you're watching from. And don't forget that throughout the stream tonight, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments as well, and we'll keep an eye on those. I always have a ton of fun answering your questions or saying hi to y'all, uh, since uh, it's kind of hard for me to tell who's watching and how many people. Sometimes it feels like I'm just speaking into a, a, a black void. So uh, it's always lovely to hear your digital voices. So if you want to say hi, uh, that would be amazing so anyway uh as uh, you know if you are a returning watcher if not uh what we normally do here at the beginning of our streams is i like to go over a little bit of space news and uh today's stream just a little fyi may be a little on the long side i honestly don't really know how long it's going to go um because uh, of the way we're going to be doing it um so we're going to do some real quick news updates cover uh, some space news that's happened in the last week and then we'll jump into our topic and today's topic by the way is rocketry so we are going to learn all about space flight and we're going to Take, tackle it from a bunch of different angles. We're going to talk about all the different uh, physical pieces as well as um, or uh, all the different scientific pieces, physical pieces, uh, parts and uh, components that go into designing spacecraft. And then we're actually going to fly some spacecraft using a really fun program that I've got. Already some people are commenting in. Melinda saying hello from Lawrence. Thanks for watching, Melinda. Steve as well uh, chiming in from Wiley, Texas. Uh, Merry Christmas, Steve says. And I say Merry Christmas right back to you, Steve. Happy holidays to everyone in the comment section. Olivia says hi as well. All right, so like I said, we're going to go over some space news real quick while we've got some people gathering around. Um, a bit of uh, sad news, uh, just to start out with. Um, it did uh, break just a few days ago that uh, Chuck Ye Yeager passed away, uh, who was the first person to break the sound barrier. Uh, he passed away at the age of 97, World War II fighter pilot, uh, very, very famous. Um, and uh, so we, uh, you know, offer our condolences to uh, Chuck's family, but uh, definitely a pioneer uh, who led to a lot of advances in aerospace as well as space travel. So uh, condolences to the Jaeger family there. And then uh, and a bit of good and bad news, I guess, uh, this um, uh, the SpaceX uh, did a test flight of their uh, Starship uh, rocket, which is uh, their new rocket platform that's uh, quite a bit bigger than their Falcon 9, and this is the eighth test flight. Uh, and uh, you can see the Starship is uh, very shiny and silver, harkening back to some classic uh, rocketry days. And so this footage, uh, we'll see the rocket uh, has a decently successful launch. And this uh, rocket, this test flight uh, went up to uh, a few uh, dozen thousand feet. I forget exactly how high it went, um, but we'll see. And actually, I'm just going to kind of cheat here a little bit and so it its flight upwards was fairly uneventful uh, now like the falcon 9 this starship uh rocket will uh is intended to land back on the earth now it's so big that it actually does this thing uh as it comes back down and actually uses its mass to um try to slow its descent uh, using aerodynamic forces against the body of the spacecraft so it's actually going sort of into this sideways uh, form on purpose to kind of create a lot of drag so it sort of almost parachutes down, uh, falling with style there. Uh, and then at the last second, uh, it will uh, come out of that, uh, that, that fall and then go into a suicide burn is what they call it, um, basically firing its rockets to slow it down really quickly right before it hits the ground uh, to try to land. Um, and, uh, and again, this is a prototype. This is the eighth prototype. There were no humans aboard this rocket, of course, and we are uh, probably a few years away from a fully successful flight of this platform. So we, we can see the engine uh, turning here, gimbling, which we'll talk about engine gimbling later in our stream. Uh, and then this rocket uh, <laughs> tried to slow it. The, uh, the, the engine tried to slow the rocket down. Uh, fortunately, as you can see, it did not slow it down 
uh, enough, and the rocket exploded on the launch pad. Nobody was hurt, of course. Everybody was very far away from these test flights, but uh, a successful mission in the sense that the rocket did go up uh, and it came back down as intended. Uh, it just had uh, what we call a RUD in the spaceship biz, uh, which stands for a Rapid Unplanned Disassembly. Uh, so congrats to SpaceX for the successful flight uh, of that rocket. But a bunch of other people, excuse me, are watching. Olivia says hi, uh, as well as Brady and Davis watching from Wellsville, Kansas. Thanks for tuning in, all you guys. Uh, Debbie is watching from Kalispell, uh, Montana. Wow, awesome. Thanks for tuning in, Debbie. Uh, Bernie is checking in from Amelia Island. Uh, says that I'm cool and you're a big fan. Well, I don't know about uh, the coolness, but I really appreciate you being, being a big fan. And uh, Amelia Island... Um, I'm definitely not Googling that right now to see where it actually is. Looks like it's in Florida, perhaps. So thanks for tuning in from that exotic location. Hopefully it's a little bit warmer down there and then up here in Kansas City. Rachel's watching. Uh, says, hi, Patrick from Leavenworth, Kansas. Favorite Monday evening routine. That's so nice to hear, Rachel. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me that uh, you guys tune in every Monday night. Hopefully I keep things a little entertaining. Uh, and uh, it definitely uh, makes my Monday nights getting to talk to all of you and show you some cool science. Sandy's watching from Colorado. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, Candace says, hello. Judith says, Merry Christmas from Tonganoxy, Kansas. Merry Christmas, Judith. Hope you're enjoying your evening. And Chris uh, says, hello, Patrick. Chris, uh, one of our longtime watchers and top fans. Thanks for tuning in yet again, Chris. Appreciate you supporting us. All right, don't forget to keep the comments coming, saying hello. If you have any questions throughout the stream, let me know. But we're going to dive in. Oh, one last bit of uh, little housekeeping. There is a very exciting event coming up uh, in just a week. You've probably been hearing it on the news. The Great Conjunction. Uh, this is the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn, where these two planets will be uh, briefly uh, lining up in our night sky, appearing almost in the exact same spot. And through a telescope, we'll be able to see them both at the same time. Now, we had grand plans at the beginning of this year to do a big public event, as you know, with the ongoing worldwide situation. Uh, that, unfortunately, won't be able to happen this year. Now, Monday night is when this ha event happens, December 21st, and that is our normally scheduled stream night. But I gotta be honest, I'm gonna be outside with my telescope watching this for myself. So that night, we will not have a live stream. Instead, we are going to reschedule that live stream to the evening prior, uh, and it'll be at 8 p.m. So it'll be Sunday the 20th at 8 p.m. And again, we'll make announcements about this so we can make sure it's on your calendar. But once again, next week's Monday live stream has moved one day earlier to Sunday the 20th of December at 8 p.m. And we'll uh, on that stream, we'll be doing a winter star tour. So it'll be a nice short stream, a what's up stream like we used to do way back in the springtime this year. Uh, and I will also be talking about the conjunction, how you can see it. This is an exciting one. This happens every 20 years because of how uh, slowly Jupiter and Saturn orbit. So it's not that rare, um, but this is the first, or this is the closest that Jupiter and Saturn have gotten since 1623. So should be pretty spectacular. Definitely don't want to miss that. I know I will not miss it, and hopefully you will not miss it as well. So tune in Sunday at uh, the 20th, this coming Sunday at 8 p.m. Uh, for our rescheduled live stream, and I'll tell you how you can see the Great Conjunction for yourself. And we got a couple of other people chiming in. Aaron says, uh, Benton says hi and is excited to learn about rockets. He's five. Well, thanks so much for watching, Benton. Hopefully you'll learn a little bit about rockets today. And Amy says hello from Manhattan. Uh, wherever Manhattan, uh, whichever Manhattan you're from, I hope you're enjoying the, uh, the apple, whether it's big or small, uh, Amy. And Susan says... Uh, can you stream it? Can we stream the conjunction? I might try to do that. So just keep track of the uh, Union Station uh, and uh, the Planetarium Facebook page as well. Actually, it'll probably be on the Planetarium page. So if you're watching from Union Station's Facebook page, be sure to like and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page, uh, where uh, if I do live stream the conjunction, I'll be doing that on that page. I'll try. It'll be a little bit hard um, to do that. Uh, uh, with because I'll be I'd have to stream it with my phone through the telescope and I've got some things I can use to line it up and maybe make it happen uh, if not though we'll post a, a link to another stream because I'm sure that NASA or some other sources will be doing a live stream uh, so if it's cloudy especially or if you won't be able to see it then uh, we will make sure there is a way uh, that you can catch that great conjunction again that'll be next Monday and we'll be streaming the evening prior on Sunday the 20th at 8 p.m. 
All right, so we're going to dive in uh, to our topic today, which is rocketry. Uh, and let's uh, bring ourselves up here. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what goes into rocket design. So we're going to be uh, building a rocket today, and we'll be using a really cool program, which I'll show you in a minute. But I want to go over some details about rockets. Uh, and uh, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a rocket scientist. So if we have any NASA engineers watching, uh, first of all, thanks for watching. Um, and uh, second of all, I apologize in advance. I'm, we're going to talk pretty generally here, so I might miss some minor points, but hopefully we'll get everything right. Uh, and I should say that I appreciate questions in the comments as well as corrections. So if you have a correction in the comments, please let me know because I love to learn as well. All right, so let's talk about rockets a little bit and what goes into designing a rocket. Um, first of all, we'll notice a lot of rockets, a lot of famous rockets are symmetrical. Uh, this is pretty easy to imagine. We've got the Saturn V rocket there. Uh, we have the SpaceX Falcon 9 that I mentioned over here. Uh, and then we have the Space Launch System, which is the current uh, launch platform that NASA is designing that potentially could take us back to the moon and beyond to Mars, perhaps. Uh, and as you can see, they are symmetrical. So the Saturn V and the SpaceX rocket uh, are basically just one long tube. Uh, and even uh, something like um, the Space Launch System, which might have these boosters on the side, which we'll talk about, it is symmetrical. So it's balanced on both sides. And that, that's important. Uh, it's important to have your rocket be balanced. Uh, and that is uh, due to the next point, which is uh, the uh, the center of gravity or the center of mass uh, on a rocket is a very important thing. Now, not all rockets are symmetrical. The space shuttle is a famous example of that. Um, but as you can see, uh, this space shuttle was actually designed um, with the center of mass in mind. That's what this stands for here. So if you ever look at the, the, um, the engines on the space shuttle, they're actually angled upwards. And that is because they're angled in line with the center of mass. So the majority of the uh, space shuttle's ascent to orbit had the fuel tank attached. And as you can see, this big, this weird shaped thing might be kind of hard to balance. Imagine if you had that and you're trying to balance it on your finger like that. Um, well, the rockets, the rocket engines are lined up with the uh, center of mass. So this is the center of thrust. That's what COT stands for. So it's important to consider the shape of your rocket. When it's symmetrical, it's easy uh, to keep balanced. Um, and if it's not symmetrical, then you need to keep track of that center of mass. Um, there is also something called a thrust to weight ratio, uh, which is basically the ratio between a rocket's engine power versus its weight. So the, there's a force of gravity pulling downwards on a rocket, and then the engines uh, are is the force that's pushing the rocket upwards. Now, obviously, if you want to make the rocket go up, it has to have more force pushing it upwards than there is force pushing it downwards. Um, so, and now this changes throughout the flight because when you use fuel, the rocket gets lighter, um, and so the weight will be decreased, uh, and so the thrust to weight ratio may increase. Um, but um, the ratio is important. It needs to be above one, basically. There needs to be more thrust pushing upwards than weight pushing downwards. Now, as the rocket tilts over, um, the ratio actually becomes higher just because of... Uh, we're not going to get deep into mathematics here, but uh, essentially there is sort of, uh, in a way, less weight pulling down, or it's pulling down at a different angle, uh, and the rocket is moving at a different angle. Again, we're not going to get too in, in deep into the physics, but just know that as the rocket starts to turn over, as it approaches orbit, which again we'll talk about later, um, the thrust to weight, thr thrust to weight ratio uh, gets higher. Now there's another uh, detail about rockets uh, called the delta V. Now this is a cool science -y term, but it's actually pretty simple to understand. Uh, delta in mathematics usually means a change, and a delta is a Greek letter, and it's uh, symbolized by just a triangle. That's a delta. Um, and, it, and again, in mathematics and physics, it describes change. And then V stands for velocity. So all delta V means is change in velocity. Essentially, the delta V of a rocket is basically the sum of all the potential energy the rocket carries. Uh, so this is factoring in all the fuel and the power of the engines on the rocket, as well as the planet's gravity. It's starting to take off from atmospheric drag, pushing downwards as it goes up. Uh, and then any maneuvers that you're planning on making. So if you're going uh, to a different uh, object in space, like going from the Earth to the moon, for example. Uh, you can kind of think of it as like the rocket's budget. So how much sort of Oomph. How much power can is the rocket taking into space? Um, now, depending on where you want to go, uh, you'll need different amounts of delta V. Now, it might be kind of hard. Yeah, it might be hard to see on here. In fact, I oh shoot, I might be able to zoom in. Oh, darn, I guess I can't zoom in. But basically, this is sort of a it looks like a subway map, but it basically is a sort of a cheat sheet chart showing cheat sheet chart. Ooh, don't say that 10 times fast. Um, a cheat sheet chart 
uh, showing uh, how much delta V, how much sort of fuel budget you need uh, to get to different places in the solar system. Uh, so basically, uh, for example, the Saturn V rocket that took us to the moon needed about 2,800 meters per second of delta V. So delta V is measured in a, a change in velocity. So uh, 2,800 meters per second is uh, the amount of uh, speed that can be uh, changed on that rocket essentially the potential energy as i said so again all you got to think about is uh, this is like the rocket's budget and then there's drag uh now of course when a rocket's going through an atmosphere there's uh, air pressure pushing on it uh, and there's a point when a rocket is lifting up uh, off called max q and that's when it's traveling so f it's, uh, traveling at a maximum speed with the highest amount of pressure pushing against it so as a rocket goes up into space it's moving out of the atmosphere so the atmosphere gets thinner the higher up you go so there's less drag but as a rocket goes upwards it's also accelerating and getting faster so as it gets faster and faster it's pushing against the air but the air is getting thinner and thinner so there's a point right in the middle called max q and that's sort of the most dangerous part of a rocket launch if you ever watch one of uh, spacex's launches they live stream every one of them i recommend checking that out if you haven't seen them uh, they t they say that uh they announce when the rocket reaches max q and basically when the rocket is past max q there's less force pushing against it and that's the less uh it, it's sort of out of the danger zone basically that's sort of the, the the most dangerous part of a rocket launch the maximum dynamic pressure uh fun fact max q is also the name of the only astronaut only band in the world um and this is a, a band of rotating members that the astronaut corps uh has created and still creates and uh, fu also a fun fact in uh January or February of 2013, uh, a very young and bald Patrick got to see Max Q perform live in front of a space shuttle. So this is a real photo. I, uh, this was at the uh, Space Exploration Educators Conference uh, for educators to learn about space uh, and Max Q performed for me. Uh, and I grew some hair since then. So uh, fun, fun fact about Max Q. Um, and the last little bit I wanna mention is uh, basically, the way a rocket moves, okay? We have engines, obviously, to push a rocket up into space, but there are all sorts of other ways that rockets move. Uh, and this this system, all these different pieces that lead into a rocket moving is called the Stability Augmentation System, or SAS. This is basically a system, usually it's computerized, um, of a bunch of different uh, thrusters and uh, tools that rockets can use to move. Now, obviously, engines uh, take rockets into space, uh, but there are a lot of other ways rockets move. And sometimes, uh, uh, things in space don't have rockets like satellites or the space station. There's no rockets aboard the space station, but they have to adjust the space station's orbital position sometimes. And to do that, there are a lot of different uh, tools you can use. There are things called reaction wheels, um, which uh, are uh, basically uh, like gyroscopes. And I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, there are other like little miniature thrusters called RCS, which stands for Reaction Control System. And you can see the space shuttle has these holes in it. These are actually little air thrusters basically that push out uh, gases uh, to sort of point the rocket in different directions. Uh, there's thrust vectoring, so sometimes engines can move around. You saw uh, the SN8, uh, the SpaceX uh, launch that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, its engine was moving around and that's how it steered. That's how the Saturn V steered uh, with thrust vectoring. And then there are also control surfaces or flaps basically like uh, wing flaps or even a, a, a rocket like the Falcon 9 has flaps to kind of help it steer downwards. Now, this uh, this uh, reaction wheel is kind of interesting. It, it, it works the same way as a cat, actually. Um, so uh, if you've ever uh, heard of the, you know, the, the phrase that cats always land on their feet, it is true if you've ever seen that. And the way cats do that is actually by uh, moving their, uh, their uh, moving themselves around their center of mass in a, in a sort of a intuitive way that allows them to move without any other forces acting against them. So they don't have any thrusters, obviously. So without any forces pushing against them or forces pushing outwards, cats are able to change their direction. And this is basically the same way a gyroscope works. And this is the same way that uh, rockets work. Uh, and here's a really cool uh, video showing this. This is a, a small example of a reaction wheel. And this is basically a, a box that's balancing on its uh, corner. And we can see in a second, you'll see a, a person try to push it over. And this reaction wheel, in this case, helps it to keep it balanced like a gyroscope but it also uh, allows it to move around. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time to watch this all the way through. Um, I wonder if I can, yeah, Oop, no, I can't zoom ahead. So anyway, you can see the person was about to touch it, of course, right when I scrolled away. Um, let's see if I can move forwards. Nope, I can't. Okay, that's fine. So anyway, uh, gyroscopes, uh, reaction wheels, okay. 
Um, so, now, uh, alright, ooh, sorry, 620. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned at the beginning that this might be a bit of a longer live stream uh, than usual. So, alright. Excuse me, I got a couple, this is, this is just soda, by the way. All the families at home. Um, <laughs> I got a, before we uh, move on, got a couple other comments and shout outs. Kathy says, excited about the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn in Branson right now, clear in 32. Hopefully the weather holds out, Kathy. Uh, Lance says, I just went outside an hour ago to check on the progress of Jupiter and Saturn. They're already very close together. Uh, so if you haven't noticed them, look towards the west in the early evening. Lydia says, hi from Hutchinson, Kansas. Thanks for tuning in, Lydia. Kathleen is saying hello from Maryville. Thanks for watching, Kathleen. All right. We're going to jump into our main event today, which is going to be using uh, a program uh, or game, I guess you could say, called Kerbal Space Program. Now, this is really fun. Uh, you may or may not have heard of this, but this is a game that's pretty similar to something like The Sims or SimCity or Roller Coaster Tycoon. If you guys have ever played those classic games where you build and manage things, well, this is basically one of those types of games, uh, but uh, for rockets. Now, I'm going to put in some headphones. Uh, because we are going to be building and hopefully launching a rocket and I'm going to need to be able to hear what's going on. Uh, so hopefully you guys can hear okay as well. Uh, so we are going to load up into Kerbal Space Program. And this is a program you can buy if you want to play at home. Uh, and it is a game, uh, but it is a really awesome educational tool as we will see during the stream today. And because it is very accurate in its uh, physics. And it will uh, teach us a lot of things about uh, building rockets and going into space. So we're going to build our own rocket uh, with all the pieces that we talked about. Um, so we're going to start with a cockpit. And there are a lot of different cockpit choices. But I'm going to pick one that has uh, three seats in it. Um, and it's going to be a, pretty similar to the Apollo Command Module cockpit. Uh, now this, uh, we're going to kind of go backwards. So we're starting with just the uh, Command Module here. And this is going to be the last thing that comes back to the Earth. Uh, now on the bottom of it, when the, uh, when the module re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, there's going to be a lot of air pushing against it, which will heat it up. And so we need a heat shield um, to uh, protect it. And so we can put a heat shield on the bottom here. And as this rocket re-enters, this heat shield will keep uh, the astronauts from getting too toasty in there. All right. Uh, so we are also going to need some parachutes because this is not very, very aerodynamic, as you can imagine. Uh, and it will just plummet to the ground unless we add some parachutes. Now, remember, I talked about symmetry. And in our program here, uh, we want things to be symmetrical as well. So I'm just putting one parachute on here. But a lot of rockets have multiple parachutes. So I can actually add parachutes. So we're going to be nice and safe here. And I'm going to add four parachutes. And they're symmetrical. So it'll keep the rocket balanced. I um, mean, we can even uh, look at where the center of gravity is on on our rocket here. So we're going to move on and we are going to add something to the top of it. We're going to add a docking port, um, which uh, we will be using a little bit later. This will let us attach, ooh, I don't need that many. This will let us attach to other things like space stations or other things that are floating around in space. Uh, and then we need to attach this to uh, the rest of our rocket, which we'll add underneath it. Um, but before we do that, we need to uh, add what's called a decoupler. So we're going to add basically something that will let us detach the top part from whatever's underneath it, okay? So we have the decoupler here, and this will let us split the top part off from everything on the bottom because the Saturn V rocket was a huge rocket that went into space all the way to the moon, but all the parts of it uh, broke off in stages, and then all that came back was just this. So there needs to be ways to separate those stages. Otherwise, you're hauling along this empty rocket with you, and that is a lot of weight, and it takes a lot of uh, power, a lot of delta V, a lot of fuel budget to move that rocket. So as you use up your fuel, you want to get rid of the, la the uh, used parts of your rocket so they don't weigh you down. All right, so next up, we are going to... Oh, the reaction wheels, by the way, are going to be built into our command pod. Um, so there are reaction wheels there, and that'll allow this command pod to move around. Now, we are going to create a transfer vehicle, which will move this command pod around when it gets to space. So I'm going to add a fuel tank, uh, and we're just going to add... Uh, let's see which fuel tank I want. I want... Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. There are a lot of fuel tanks in this game, as you can see. <laughs> this is the one I want. That's a good size. We're going to add that there. Okay. Uh, so this is, just has a certain amount of fuel, and uh, you can see it has two different types of fuel, liquid fuel and oxidizer. And when these two fuels mix, they uh, can ignite in our engine. Um, and we keep them separated so they don't ignite while they're in the spaceship. Um, all right, we're going to add an engine to our rocket. And our engines here, we have a lot of engine choices. But we're going to pick 
uh, a engine with a very fun name. Uh, it's called the Poodle. So, uh, as you can see, the color and uh, types of rockets are often homages in this game to real rockets, but they're going to be a, a little bit fictional here. Oh, look, you can see the planetarium flag back there. I didn't realize it would pop up there. That's nice. Um, look at that. How's that for branding? <laughs> All right. So, we're going to... So, we added a rocket. Now, this uh, rocket engine is gimbaled, so I can uh, right-click on it here. Uh, and we can see details about this engine, uh, how much thrust it uh, gives us, uh, the propellant it uses. So we want to make sure we bring the right propellant, otherwise the engine won't work. And then it tells us its gimbal range, so it can move the engine uh, at a radius of about 5 degrees. So that'll help us to steer our rocket a little bit. All right. So, um, hopefully the music isn't too loud. Uh, if uh, ma if uh, <laughs> if it is too loud, then uh, somebody let me know, please, and I can turn that down. All right, so we're gonna move on. So what else do we wanna add? So uh, we want to help this rocket move around and so we wanna add some thrusters to it. We wanna add some uh, RCS thrusters, some reaction control thrusters, little thrusters that will help us move around in space. We're gonna add four of them to keep this symmetry um, and we're gonna put them right there and we might move them in a bit. Um, but these thrusters use a different type of fuel. Uh, they use a fuel called monopropellant, which is just a single propellant fuel. And we want to use a different fuel uh, source for those because when you get to space, you don't want uh, sort of dirty fuel floating around the spaceship. You want to use a type of fuel uh, that'll just expel clean gas out into space, essentially. And so we can bring some monopropellant fuel tanks. We'll just put four of them on there just to be safe. Uh, this game, by the way, has... Uh, this is the uh, sort of cheating mode where we don't have to pay for anything, but this game also uh, has some more advanced modes where you have to unlock certain things by accomplishing scientific goals uh, and then uh, you can uh, make some make some money by doing science and then afford uh, better parts of the rocket. So it's a pretty fun game, pretty detailed uh, with the physics and sort of the management aspect too. You're not sponsored, by the way. <laughs> All right, so we've added those uh, reaction control systems, thrusters. Uh, we want to add an antenna just so we can uh, communicate with our... Um, astronauts back home. Uh, we don't need four of them probably, so uh, we can just put one of them. We want to keep it pretty balanced, so um, let's put that antenna, uh, let's just put it right there. Sure, why not? Right on top of our logo. <laughs> That's fine. All right, uh, we want, uh, now the um, the reaction control system, sorry, no, the, the stability assistance system, the reaction wheels inside here, uh, they're going to use electricity. So our rocket has a certain amount of electric charge built into it, um, but we want to bring some batteries along just to give us a little extra juice. So we're going to add four batteries to here. Um, and we are going to... Uh, now the batteries uh, will use up their charge as they're used, so of course we want to add some solar panels. Uh, we have a couple different choices for solar panels, but we will just add uh, these. We'll just add four of them. Why not? Because we have unlimited money in our uh, thing there, in our uh, program here. All right, so this is a nice uh, little tr uh, uh, command module and uh, service module here. We'll call this the service module that has the fuel uh, to move this rocket uh, from orbit to the moon. But we have to get this part of the rocket to orbit because this rocket by itself does not have enough thrust to get to orbit. In fact, our uh, program here can actually tell us uh, how much thrust our rocket uh, has. Uh, Let's see. So it's not showing us right now, uh, but uh, it might be because I'm, I'm I'm messing with something over here that I'm I don't want to spoil. So I'm gonna uh, spoil it a little bit later. Um, there we go. Okay, so the delta V, uh, we can see we have about uh, 600 meters per second of delta V. That's our fuel budget. That is not enough to get to space. Uh, and our thrust to weight ratio is only 0.4. So if we try to launch this, it would not get off the ground, basically. So we need to add something to, uh, we need to add an ascent module, something that will um, bring this part of the rocket up into space. Um, but before we do that, I, I meant to mention we need to balance things out because remember how I mentioned the center of gravity? Well, if we look at if we look at our center of gravity, um, and we uh, when we look at our thrusters here, if we use these little reaction control thrusters to try to move our rocket around, um, our program here is telling us that it's going to spin around wildly. So basically, it's not balanced. Essentially, we want the thrusters to be near the center of mass for it to uh, move the way we want it to move. So what we can do here is we can move. 
things around a little bit. And if we move our reaction control, control thrusters down, uh, closer to the center of mass, we might have to move our batteries up. But if we move everything down there, there we go. So now when we use these thrusters, uh, our rocket will not spin out of control, basically. So that's going to be very helpful when we try to dock a little bit later. Okay, so as I said, we are going to get this part of the rocket up into space because right now it does not have enough oops, enough oomph to get there. So we are going to uh, move on to uh, the next part and we are going to add another decoupler uh, because when we use the ascent module, we want to be able to detach it. So we are going to add that there and our program is going to make a nice little list called a fairing, just kind of a, a covering uh, so that the engine inside, while, when it's not being used, um, is not affected by the atmosphere. And we're going to add some more, uh, some more fuel tanks and some more, um, doo -doo 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 -doo, some more engines. So we're going to add, uh, all right, we're just going to cheat and I'm going to type it in. <laughs> okay. I want to add engine down here, this one. All right, so we're gonna add three of these. Hopefully that'll be enough fuel. And then we're gonna add a uh, an engine called the main sail, um, which will be, uh, doo -doo -doo. there it is. That will give us a nice amount of thrust to get upwards. All right, so we have the ascent module here and an engine. Uh, and we can see our delta V is much higher. This part of the rocket has a 2700 delta V. So that fuel budget just got a lot higher. And this part of the rocket has a higher thrust to weight ratio too, of about two times. So it has enough force to counteract the gravity by almost two times. All right, now we want some more control surfaces. Um, so I'm gonna add some winglets here. Um, uh, let's add, do 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 do. Uh, winglet, probably doesn't matter if I get the exact one that I wrote down, but just to be safe, there we go. That's the one I wanted. And we're gonna keep it nice and symmetrical, so we're gonna add four of them to the bottom. And these are, uh, uh, can vector, so they can move around, and this will help us to steer our rocket as it goes up. Now, because I've played this game before, uh, because I know a little bit more about physics, I know this is not enough by itself to get into space. We need some boosters. Uh, and these boosters are gonna be solid rocket boosters. And we're gonna use uh, a booster uh, called the kickback. But first, actually, I need to add some attachment points. Um, so, oops, uh, we are going to, uh, because when we use the boosters, we want to be able to detach them, which you'll see a little bit later. And we're gonna angle them between the fins here. So these are detachment points, um, which we will be able to uh, detach our booster. And we're gonna use, um, a solid rocket booster, and these solid rocket boosters are very similar uh, to the ro solid rocket boosters used by the space shuttle. Uh, the two rocket boosters off to the side of the orange tank on board the space shuttle. And we're just going to position them downwards a little bit like that. Uh, these are not very aerodynamic, so we're going to add a nose cone to the top of them, uh, whoop, preferably pointing upwards. Really doesn't want to attach. That's very odd. Come on, do, 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 do. interesting, perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> uh, why are you not attaching? Let's try this, let's just do that, and still not attaching, very odd. I definitely tested this before. Um, yeah, if we can't get it attached, that's okay. Now we're gonna skip that for now. Okay, so uh, <laughs> one more thing. This rocket is just floating above the ground, so we need to add a launch tower. And so this launch tower is just gonna attach to the boosters. This is not how you would uh, launch a, a rocket, of course, in the real world, um, but... Really gonna try to attach these nose cones because that might be a problem. Perfect. <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. Oh, I saw them stick there for one second. 
I know I can do it. Uh, no, I don't want to put it on the top. Uh, it's a bit of a janky game, I'll be honest. You know what? We're going to go without the nose cones. No worries. It'll be fine. We don't need nose cones. All right, so here is our rocket. And this, uh, with all the Delta V combined, should be enough to get us into orbit and uh, beyond, hopefully. Um, so pay no attention to what I'm doing right here. <laughs> um, so we are going to go ahead and wait, what should we call this rocket? Uh, let's call it, uh, let's see, uh, we'll call it the Patrick X1. All right, perfect. And we're gonna launch this baby. All right, while we're waiting for it to load, let's check into the comments. Lance says, cool, where can I find that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction chart you just displayed? Um, you can find it on Google. I'm not sure where I found it, uh, but it's been popping up around quite a bit. If we just search Jupiter-Saturn conjunction chart, I bet you'll find something. We can maybe try to uh, put it uh, in the comments uh, section as well of this video. Now, Thomas is watching from Chicago. Uh, Eric says, howdy from Manhattan. Thanks for watching, I'm Eric. Uh, another one of our longtime watchers. Lance says, uh, let's see, uh, <laughs> in reference to the uh, uh, cheat sheet chart, I'm glad I was attempting to say, I'm glad that I, you were attempting to say it instead of me, Lance says, I would have definitely have accidentally gotten censored, yes. Um, well, we did not have that mistake. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is our rocket. Now we are gonna attempt to launch this rocket into orbit and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, that process as we do it. So I'm gonna be launching a rocket and teaching you how it works at the same time because I'm just that awesome. Uh, just to touch briefly on our simulation here, I want to mention that it's a bit different. This is not Earth. Now, the Kerbal Space Program has its own special solar system. Uh, Earth here is called Kerbin, and it has two moons. Uh, and then the solar system has a smaller number of planets, but this might remind you of some of the other programs we've used. And one other big difference is that um, the planet is one-tenth the size of Earth, so its gravity is much lower, and it'll be a lot easier to lift off from. So uh, it's a lot easier than real-world space travel. Um, and one other difference is that this uses this doesn't use in-body physics. It uses two-body physics. Now I'm not going to get deep into what that means, but essentially um, the simulation of gravity is a little bit simplified to make it sort of easier to play. Um, and then uh, and we'll be cheating in some other ways as well, just because we're doing this live. Um, now one other thing is we need to talk about our location on the Earth. Now, a lot of launch sites are often near uh, the equator. And that's why our main launch platform is down in Florida. That's the farthest south we can really get in the United States, uh, close to the equator. And you, the reason you want to launch close to the equator is because at the equator, you have the highest potential uh, velocity. You have the highest um, kinetic energy from the Earth. So the Earth is spinning around at, a, at an even rate, right? But if you were near the pole, then you would be spinning around more slowly than somebody at the equator. So if you launched a rocket from the equator, you get sort of an extra boost from that uh, velocity. Um, and then uh, now another thing we want to I want to mention is that we have a mission today. Uh, we are going to not only launch our rocket into orbit, but we are going to, but we are going to try to rendezvous with another rocket that I sent up a little bit earlier today. Uh, and this is actually a, a, a lander. It's a lunar lander. And if we rendezvous with it successfully with enough time, and you guys want me to, then we will try to land this on the moon. But we're going to take it one step at a time. So I'm going to try to launch this rocket, and I'm going to try to land it uh, on or I'm trying, gonna try to dock it with this lander. Um, now, uh, before we do that, we need to, uh, first of all, if I'd launched right now, it probably wouldn't, uh, it'd be really hard to get to this lander. So I'm gonna, this program is really uh, nifty because you can fast forward time. So we're gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna fast forward and I'm gonna wait for my uh, probe that's in orbit here to get a little bit closer. And I'm gonna wait till it's sort of right behind uh, our space center here. All right, there we go. So we're, it's coming up on us. That'll help us out a little bit. I'm also going to save real quick. And uh, we are gonna try to launch. Now, there's one important thing that I have not mentioned yet, uh, and that is something called staging. Now, remember I mentioned that the Saturn V rocket had a lot of different parts that would separate at certain times. Now, I just wanna show you a quick demo of what happens if you don't plan your staging. So over here on the left-hand side, the stuff I was messing with earlier is our staging. So these are all the different actions that the rocket can take, like activating uh, its engines and uh, decoupling things. I just wanna show you that if I don't do any staging uh, and I just launch it at the same time, then things are gonna go very poorly, as you can see. That might have been a little loud. I'll turn the volume down. Um, so luckily our little astronauts, Valentina, Bill, and Bob, 
uh, our little green space people uh, survived that launch, but I would not exactly call that a successful launch. Uh, so we are going to uh, load real quick and we're gonna try that again. And we are going to fix our staging because it's very important that we launch everything in the correct order. So when I hover over these different bits, it's gonna show us all the different parts that can do stuff on our rocket. And the first thing we wanna do is we wanna activate our solid rocket boosters and we wanna detach them. So let's find our rocket boosters, these. Um, so we're gonna add a bunch of different stages here. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna activate these rockets and then we're going to detach them from the launch platform. So our rocket will be taking off. Now these are solid rocket boosters. That means they only have an on and an off switch. When they, when they activate, you cannot turn them off. Uh, the other engines that we have are, um, we are able to throttle them up and down. And that, there's an important uh, difference uh, uh, that, that's an important difference when you're designing rockets and launching them into space. Um, the space shuttle, for example, had solid rocket boosters on either side of it, uh, and then it had a liquid fuel inside that tank, the orange tank. Um, and so uh, the different types of rockets and fuels serve different purposes. And we're not going to dive too deep into the physics of that, but uh, just know that uh, those are very different types of engines and fuel supplies. Um, and you can see the engines are actually attached to the fuel supplies for these solid rocket boosters. Okay, then after, so you can you notice we're not going to activate this um, engine right here. Uh, we are going to keep it off and save the fuel until these other boosters are used up. But then when they are used up, we want to detach them. So we are going to make the next action item, the next stage to detach the boosters. And then following that, we are going to activate that engine. That engine will take us up into orbit. Now when we are in orbit and we have used all this fuel, we'll want to detach the bottom of uh, this empty fuel tank because that'll be weighing down our, uh, our um, module up there in the top, our transfer vehicle. Uh, and once that's detached, we can activate the engine of our transfer vehicle. And then once we're done with our mission, we can detach the uh, transfer vehicle from our uh, command module up here. Uh, and then the final step is activating the parachutes. All right, so we have successfully uh, checked our staging and corrected it. Uh, don't forget, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to put them in the comments section uh, below. If you tune in, tune in late, we are using a program called Kerbal Space Program, which is a simulation program where we can build and pilot rockets ourselves. Oh, I just realized there's a the little uh, planetarium flag. Look how cool that is. Branding. All right, are we ready to launch? So again, we are going to launch and uh, okay, our probe is nearly above us, which is okay. Um, and we are going to, now when I launch, I'm going to be, I'm gonna to want to launch in the direction that the earth is spinning. Otherwise we'd be working against that kinetic energy. And so I'm gonna be starting to sort of tip over uh, to the side, over to that direction, uh, west, I believe. Um, and we are gonna go ahead and we are just going to launch. Now, uh, our uh, atmosphere is a lot lower in this program than the Earth atmosphere. The Kerbal atmosphere is 75 kilometers and real life is about 160 kilometers. Um, so we will get into orbit much more quickly, but let's just go ahead and start. So let's do a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, here we are. We are taking off. Our solid rocket boosters are firing and remember we did not control them we just lit them and they are off we cannot turn them off at this point and i'm going to turn on our stability assistance program here and this uh, computer system will help me to steer the spacecraft every time you see this little yellow indicator that means i am moving our rocket so i am steering it with my keyboard here and i am moving it over very slightly i don't want to tip it over too much otherwise the rocket will uh, crash back down to Earth. So we are slowly making it orbit. Our indicator here tells us how high up we are. We're about 4,000 meters. Woo, that almost tipped over too far. Um, at about 15,000 meters, we want to be at about a 45 degree angle. And we are going to keep things heading towards the west, moving over to the side. This is our nav ball. This is showing us the direction we are facing as well as the direction of our orbital path. That's what this yellow indicator is, which we will talk about. All right, there we go. We just used our uh, solid rocket booster. So we want to stage, we want to get rid of that dead weight. And then we want to fire our next engine and we're going to throttle it up and we're going to continue onwards up to space. So we're going to tip over to about 45 degrees here. Oh, our solid rocket boosters just exploded. You might've heard that. Um, we can turn the volume up just a tiny bit. 
All right, now I can go over to our map view and we can see our computer is telling us that if I turn the engine off right now, we would crash back down to Earth. So we need to get up high enough that we get out of the atmosphere. And when we get out of the atmosphere, we can reach orbit. So we're gonna keep this angle for a little while and you can see our arc is getting higher and higher as we get further and further up. We can also keep track of the Delta V, our fuel budget, how much fuel we have. And we have plenty of Delta V left, so we are doing pretty well. Now, in just a moment, we will see uh, the color change. That means we are gonna exit the atmosphere. Now I'm gonna give ourselves a little bit of extra oomph. We're gonna go up to about 100 kilometers, and we're gonna stop because as you can see, our altitude, our, our top altitude is getting lower because we're traveling through the atmosphere. The air is dragging us down, slowing us down. Okay, so we are now on our way, arcing upwards. We're still heading upwards, but I just turned the engine off because we don't need to waste any fuel because we already are gonna get high enough. Uh, now this little AP stands for apoapsis, and we are gonna talk about uh, orbital elements now. So I'm gonna tell you all about the different parts of an orbit that NASA rocket uh, engineers and pilots need to know when they're planning out their rockets. And the apoapsis is basically the uh, highest point in your orbital path. And the opposite of that is something called periapsis, and that's the lowest point. Now, we don't really have a periapsis because our, we don't really have an orbit right now. Um, our rocket would crash back down to Earth, as you can see. It is not a circle. Uh, the other rocket here, our lander, is orbiting currently. That's where that gray line is. The blue line is us. So we're going to wait till our apoapsis, our highest point, and that is the point that we are going to fire our rockets. Now, we are going to... Um, we're going to go ahead and aim towards the horizon using our navigation uh, instrument here. So I'm going to kind of tilt us over. Again, we are using reaction wheels. You can see our engine gimbling here, but it's not on, so that's not helping us move. It's the gyroscope inside the top of our spacecraft here that is helping us to move. I can also turn our reaction control system, and you can see these jets uh, pushing us. Um, and there we go. So we are going to get ourselves lined up with the horizon. That's what this little nav ball is showing us our angle of attack here. Ooh. Uh, a little too far. Ah. This is a big rocket. It takes a lot of energy to push it over. So we're going to wait till we're at our very highest point, and that's where we're going to fire our rockets to get us into orbit. Checking into the comment section while we're waiting. Patient says it seems a bit above my Cub Scouts level, K through third grade. What do you think? I'll definitely show it to them. I find it fun and interesting. Uh, you know, it may not be. Definitely show it to them. Um, it, there's a very low ceiling in terms of learning curve. It starts really easy. You can start pretty easy, and there are a lot of tutorials uh, to teach you all the basics of rocket design, uh, and you can definitely get advanced if you want. Okay, oop, here we are. So I'm gonna fire our rockets on full blast. Uh, and you can see when our rocket is going, it's a lot easier to steer because we have that gimbal now. And if I open this up, looking at our map, we can see that the circle is getting bigger. And eventually it will reach a point where we will not fall back into the atmosphere and we will be orbiting. So we are going to keep firing. We can see we have a little bit of fuel left remaining in this stage of our rocket. But what I'm going to do here actually is I'm going to cut off the engines right before we reach orbit because this part of the rocket here is a lot of dead weight and I don't want it floating around in space. I don't want to create space junk. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to, uh, I'm going to fire our stage and I'm going to get rid of this bottom part even though we still have some fuel left because it's more important to uh, uh, waste a little bit of fuel if we won't leave space junk in space. So we have separated and we now have this little part uh, so we are going to get this engine going and we can move away. So the bottom part of the rocket is going to fall back down to Earth, burn up in our atmosphere, uh, into the ocean. I definitely plan that so it won't uh, hurt anybody. Um, but now, woo, now we are in our little ascent module here, or not even ascent module, this is our uh, transfer module. And the top part that we are going to use uh, to get everywhere else we want to go in space. And it has much less delta V than the other part of the rocket, but it's now that we are near space, um, it is going to be plenty of Delta V. So we are going to fire the engine here, uh, keeping us in line with the horizon. And that will bring our circle around the planet. And if we keep going far enough, we will eventually reach a full orbit. So when that red goes away, then we will know that we are high enough. We're just about there. There we go. We have reached orbit. Okay. We are now in orbit. 
Uh, oop, and very zoomed out from our rocket. But there we go. Congratulations. I did not crash as I approached orbit. We are now floating around in space. David asked if the solid rocket uh, rockets are binary on and off, then how are we able to steer the rocket? Doesn't seem like you could control this. Well, that's why I added those flaps. Those flaps helped us to control it. The space shuttle has flaps on the wings, for example, and the other engines of the space shuttle are gimbaled. When the space shuttle lifted off, it used the rocket boosters and the space shuttle engines at the same time, uh, and that's kind of how they helped it to steer. Oh, that's a great question, David. All right, so our uh, stability assistant uh, system here, uh, stability augmentation system officially will help us to, uh, it's kind of like autopilot. Right now we're just kind of floating around in space and um, it's kind of hard to control. I just have to keep moving it around and that uses a lot of energy. Um, so we can actually uh, target different positions. Now we want to uh, target uh, prograde here, which it's not wanting to do. All right, there we go. Let's turn. Oh, we might. Nope, we have our electric charge. Oh, there we go. I accidentally messed with the setting. There we go. So now our rocket is on autopilot. It's keeping us pointed in the right direction. Uh, we also might as well extend the solar panels uh, and soak up some rays, and that will keep our uh, electric charge charging. So we've been using uh, charge for a while. Um, but when the solar panels are facing the sun, that will charge us back up. There you go. Now we're charging our batteries. Awesome. All right, now we're in space. Cool. Brandy says, this is so cool. Hi from Stella from the Girl Scout Astronomy Club. Hey, Stella, thanks for watching. Uh, so glad you're tuning in. Uh, I, I bet you have heard of Kerbal Space Program, knowing all of your amazing uh, science know-how. Uh, but thanks for watching, Stella. Great to see you. All right. <clears throat> so we are now in space. It's 6.50 and we haven't even rendezvoused. Um, so we're going to make this a long stream, folks. We're going to just keep going. I'm not even sure how many people are watching, but uh, for those of you who want to stick around, we're just going to keep rolling. I'm having fun. Hopefully you guys are having fun. And we are going to try to rendezvous with our lander. Now, there's a problem. It's ahead of us in the orbital path. Uh, so we need to catch up to it. And we're going to catch up to it by adjusting our orbit. Uh, so right now, our orbit is uh, a little bit wider than the uh, this... Uh, lander's orbit. <clears throat> so we want to make our orbit smaller and that will make us go a little faster. Uh, so if our orbit is sort of inside the other one's orbit, then we'll hopefully be able to catch up. Uh, so uh, we can make our orbit smaller by uh, pointing in the opposite direction that we're going and firing our engines. So we're going to target retrograde, which is against the direction uh, that we are traveling. <clears throat> and uh, we can fire our engine a little bit, and that will adjust our apoapsis. That's the furthest point. Now, this isn't the best place to do this, but I'm just going to do it right here in the interest of time. Uh, but we want to don't, don't want to do it too much. We don't want our periapsis to fall below 70,000. Oop, which there it looks like it was about to. So we might uh, actually wait to do this maneuver. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I'm going to wait uh, actually until woo, we are at apoapsis. And when we are at the furthest point away, uh, we can... Uh, do a prograde maneuver. Basically, if we fire our engine in the direction we're traveling now, it's going to make the other side go up higher. It's going to increase our speed, which will increase the altitude at our periapsis. So uh, also these little numbers up here will help me to uh, see that. So there we go. That's a little bit higher. That makes me feel a little better. Uh, but we still want to catch up to our lander here. So I'm going to fast forward again. All right, at periapsis, I'm going to fire in retrograde. So I basically, I want to make my orbit circle a little bit smaller than the orbit circle of uh, my target. So I'm firing up here. All right, ooh, uh-oh, I fired too much. <laughs> now my orbit's red, that means I'm going to crash back down. My periapsis is too low. Uh, let's bring that back up. All right, above 70, we're safe. Okay, so now my blue orbit, my orbit is inside of the other orbit, and that means I'll be able to catch up to it. Uh, Anita says, I'm here, uh, as well as Mary. Um, thanks for continuing to watch, guys. Hope you're enjoying the stream. We'll just keep vamping. If you just want to, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in. Chris is having a blast watching. No pun intended. Yeah, I'm sure you didn't intend that pun, Chris. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to target this lander. And this is going to give me some helpful information to catch up to it. 
Now, if I fast forward time here, my distance to it is going to get lower, and it's going to keep getting lower, uh, as you can see, uh, as we go around. But there's something else I can do. I can do a maneuver that will adjust my uh, position. So I want to do a maneuver uh, to get my orbit to match this uh, orbit. Now you can see if I line things up on the side, my orbit is at a different angle. Now we have a name for this type of thing. The angle of an orbit is called its eccentricity, um, and or sorry, its inclination rather. And that's how uh, inclined the orbit is, what angle it is. So we want the inclinations of our orbits to match. And uh, we can adjust that at this point right here. Actually, it's called the ascending node. And so um, I can actually add a maneuver and this will help me to plan out uh, the maneuver that I want to do. So um, basically I can do a sort of a test orbit uh, and if I drag these lines here uh, it will show me the dotted line of what's going to happen if I do a maneuver at this point. Uh, now the maneuver is four seconds away um, so I planned it much too quickly. Usually you plan these uh, very far in advance but we can do it real quick here. So if I point in the direction that the game is telling me to and I fire my engine in just the right way it's going to move my orbit up in line with the orange orbit, my target. So you can see I'm moving up in line. And once my maneuver is done, oop, then I am much closer to my target. <clears throat> so these maneuvers, uh, uh, astronauts, or not really astronauts, but rocket engineers and NASA scientists uh, will obviously do with their own computer systems. They don't opt to use Kerbal Space Program, although a lot of them play this game. Um, but they use a lot of math and fancy calculations to plan these before they even launch the rockets. So we're doing a lot of this on the fly. That's not what would really happen in space. <clears throat> so I want to catch up with this lander and I'm on my way to catching up here. But I can uh, plan a maneuver in the future that will help me to catch up. So I'm going to plan this maneuver sort of halfway around. And if I click here, you can add this maneuver. And uh, because the game, because I've targeted this lander, I can... Uh, adjust things here actually I want to I want to wait to catch up a little bit more so I'm gonna keep going until I get much closer okay all right so I'm gonna plan a maneuver here and I want I need to raise my orbit up to match uh, my target now what happened here is it's actually telling me uh, the closest approach, so how close I'm going to get to the target. And I'm getting pretty close here. And the game is telling me over here as well. And I can actually do some really fine, uh, oop, fine editing. Oh, what, what happened? There we go. So I can plan out. So this is maybe a little bit closer to what scientists pl are planning. So this is basically helping me to plan exactly how, what direction to point my engine in. Uh, to get my rocket as close to my target as possible. So this is what SpaceX would do if they're trying to get their Dragon capsule to the space station. So I'm just adjusting these different directions. Now these different directions have names uh, in uh, space flight and in the game as well. Uh, there's prograde and retrograde. That's uh, prograde is firing in the direction you're going. Retrograde is firing against uh, the direction you're going. There's normal and anti-normal, um, which is... Whoop, uh, I'm going to add that again. There we go. Um, the, the normal and anti-normal uh, will change your inclination, the angle of your orbit. Uh, and then there's a radial in and radial out, which will change um, the uh, shape of your orbit, uh, kind of like a, moving a hula hoop sort of side to side, if that makes sense. Um, so, okay, this maneuver is in T minus six minutes. I've got a little bit of time to plan it out. Now, basically what I'm doing is I am adjusting my plan so that I, point, I fire my rockets in just the right, right way that it gets my rocket very close to my target. So over here, this is telling me the closest intersection. And right now it's at about 600 meters. I think I can do better. I can, I want to get it very close, like maybe close to about 500 meters. Um, ooh, even closer. Cool, cool. Now, all these things are computerized in the real world, so uh, you wouldn't have human error, uh, but I want to get really close because I might accidentally uh, turn the engine off a little too soon or a little too late. Um, all right, there we go, within 200 meters. I don't want to get too close because I don't want to crash into uh, my rocket. Okay, so there we go. So now I can use my computer system, my SAS, to target my maneuver. So basically, 
Um, if we look at our rocket, it's going to be pointing in a very weird direction. Like, shooting our engines towards the planet like this might not seem like a good idea, but we're only going to fire them for a very short amount of time. In fact, the burn time is estimated to be one second long. And this is how much fuel we're going to use. So it tells me I'm going to use about 17 meters per second of delta V. Again, that's our fuel budget. That's our movement budget. So if I look at our vessel budget, it's going to tell me this vessel has about 2,000 meters per second of delta V. So I've got plenty of fuel for this little maneuver. Um, so we are going to basically wait. We don't have to wait four minutes. We can fast forward time uh, and get ourselves a little closer to the maneuver. Uh, and we can actually already see our target here. We're coming up on it, getting closer and closer. And we are coming in hot, fast forwarding. Okay, slow down time a little bit. Uh, our Kerbals down here are getting very excited. Pilot Valentina Kerman is ready for the maneuver. And whoop, there we go. All right, so we're going to start a little bit ahead of time. And cut off the engines. Okay. Now let's see. Let's see how close our closest approach is. So if we, uh, oh, we already have set our target, and it looks like our close approach uh, is somewhere around here. Uh, it's going to tell us right there. Uh, it's going to be 0.1 kilometers, so about 100 meters away. Uh, so we are catching up to our uh, target here. In fact, we can watch it approach as we fast forward here. All right, so we're going to intersect within 100 meters in T minus 10 minutes, 9 minutes. Again, we're fast forwarding time here. While we're waiting, I've um, got a question from Eric uh, who says, what would, uh, what would have happened if you would not have launched the rocket at a 45 degree angle? It's a good question. If you had tried to launch the rocket straight up, then that curve uh, would have been much tighter and it would have taken a lot more energy to circularize it. That's what we call it when you get to the top of the curve and you stretch that orbit out to go around the planet. Um, so by going up at an angle, uh, and not even 45 degrees, but at a gradual angle, slowly angling as you go up, then you're using your momentum and you're using the least amount of fuel possible. It's the most efficient way. But that's a really great, great question, Eric. Thanks for asking that. All right, we're coming in close. Six minutes. Again, we're fast forwarding time here to get closer and closer. And I'm going to try to successfully dock with my probe before uh, our stream runs out. Um, <laughs> there's no time limit. If you guys are enjoying the stream, uh, then let me know in the comments uh, and we'll keep going. I'm having fun. I might just keep streaming if, unless, uh, I get the, unless I get the, uh, the cane to pull me off the stage. All right. We're getting very close. Uh, and we are actually, actually I need to do something quick because we are traveling towards our target at 45 meters per second, which means we would... Uh, we will pass by it very quickly. So what I want to do is I want to actually point my rocket uh, away from my target, okay? In the, away from not just the target, but the direction the target is going. Now, again, the computer system is planning this, this out. And so the angle that I am now firing my engine in is slowing my rocket down relative to the target. So relative to the, t to the target, you can see here, I am starting to slow down, and I'm still coming in very fast, but I want to be coming in a much slower so I can control it. So let's keep it at about, uh, let's keep it at about five meters per second. That seems like a safe bet. Now we are going to intersect it in about, or within about, uh, now it says 41 kilometers. That's uh, not what I wanted to do. Um, so we are going to, uh, let's see. Um, so now we're moving away from it. Uh, so what we're going to be doing, actually, I'm going to do a very fancy maneuver here uh, that will get us back on track. Um, so I want to slow down relative to target. Oop, but now I'm going away from the target. Let's go back towards the target. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of aim myself uh, to... Get back in line. Okay, so now we are moving towards the target. I'm going to turn on my reaction control system because these thrusters are going to help me to uh, properly get in line with the target. All right. So basically, I'm going to be using my nav ball here uh, to hopefully line myself up with the target. So I'm moving in. Uh, my intersection is at 800 meters, so I'm going to 
be adjust firing my jets to get my intersection closer. And that. Uh, all right, firing my main engine. Oop. Okay, a little bit too far. And I'm I'm kind of a <laughs> eyeballing. I'm I'm just experimenting here. Okay, there we go. All right. So it was very important that I got the center of gravity uh, correct on my rocket here, because otherwise, if I had fired these jets, the whole rocket would be spinning out of control. Um, so I, what I want to do is I want uh, my target. Uh, to be lined up with the direction I'm going, obviously, because then uh, we will uh, intersect with it. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to dock with our target here. So I am... Basically, I am pushing my rocket to the side to try to line it up with the target. So you can see this yellow cursor here is... Uh, the target. I want the target to be right in front of me, so I'm heading right towards it. There we go. And now everything is nice and lined up. So I am I'm going to intersect within 20 meters of the target. That is awesome. Let's try to get it even closer. Why not? Alright. It's a little hard to get it exact, but that's fine. Okay, now I'm moving towards the target at about 5 meters per second. I'm going to get within 14 meters of it. Perfect. And so now I don't have to use the engine, I can use these little thrusters to do these like tiny little maneuvers. I should remember to save in case I crash into my target. All right, so let's fast forward and get ourselves a little bit closer. Woo, not too close, all right. So we're still moving towards our target here and let's uh, line ourselves up even closer. All right, we're gonna go within one meter. I'm also gonna start slowing us down. So there's even less of a chance of us crashing in to our target. And actually, there's one other thing I'm going to do because this probably looks super unexciting uh, because of how dark it is. So I also probably should have planned this to happen on the daytime side of the planet. But luckily, we have control over time. So I got our rockets pretty much stationary. And I'm just going to warp around. And hopefully not get too far away before we go into the daytime side. Uh-oh. Getting kind of far away again. <laughs> Let's fire back towards. All right, there we go. Now the sun is out. Okay. Shed some light on this situation. All right, so we are heading back towards our lander. Now, this uh, is a lunar lander that we could potentially take to one of the moons. Uh, now, the Saturn V rocket to get to the moon, we uh, took the lander up with it, so you wouldn't have to do this maneuver. But there are ideas for future space, mis space missions where we might send a lander up first uh, and then rendezvous with it like we are going to do in the game here. So, as we get close to this, uh, what I can do actually is I can switch to the other uh, lander we can see it right here as we are coming in and the docking ports on the side here So I'm gonna have to line things up and I did practice this earlier. So hopefully it won't take too long um, So we are gonna get in a little bit closer I'm just gonna fire my jets and Slow down Also gonna save again <laughs> Keep things nice and lined up. All right. Now, I'm going to turn on my targeting computer. I do not have the force, un unlike Luke, so I'm going to need this. And the docking port is facing that way, so I'm going to align my rocket up. Oop, ah, spinning around. Listen, flying spaceships is hard. Um, zoom in a little bit here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, got it pretty much lined up. Uh, and to help out, of course, we are going to use this device here. So basically, uh, very simply, we want to get all of these little lines lined up. Okay. So now we are basically oriented uh, with the docking port facing the same direction. But obviously I need to uh, push the rocket backwards a little bit. Um, I need to push it down a little bit too. And let's start uh, pushing it towards the other rocket. 
All right, how's everybody doing? David's saying, this is a lot of fun. Please keep the stream coming. All right, just for you, David. <laughs> All right, let's get this guy over here. So we are going to try to line these up. And we're doing it very slowly. In space, this would happen uh, very, very slowly. Uh, in fact, at the space station, they don't even usually manually dock. They have a robotic arm to grab uh, the uh, modules and just kind of manually pull them in. All right, there we go. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. <laughs> also, in real life, you can't uh, fast forward, of course. Uh, also, my rocket's like upside down. I'm going to turn it around a little bit. That'll help me. Yeah, there we go. Okay, all right. Okay, keep vamping. I guess I don't need to keep talking, right? You guys know I'm here. Uh, David says, uh, oh, make sure I don't crash into this. Early in the stream, you explain why rocket launch sites are usually located near the equator. USA, China, and UAE all have territory close to the equator, but Russia is located very far north. Where does the Russia launch their rockets from? Uh, that's a really a great question that off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to. Um, but, uh... We can look up. Look at this. I'm piloting a spaceship and trying to answer your question in real time. Whoa, almost overshot it. All right. Let's keep things moving there. Now, it looks like the uh, Boikonur Cosmodrome uh, is where uh, is their space launch facility, and that is in Kazakhstan. Uh, and so that's a, a bit further south. Uh, but it is still a bit north, um, and uh, honestly, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure uh, that might just be the best uh, location that they have access to, um, but that's something I'd have to do a little more research. I'm not going to pretend like I know the answer <laughs> and give you a, a false answer, but that's a really good question because that's a good point. Not everybody has as good of access to, um, uh, you know, equator close launch sites. All right, so we are going to line these up. I could just eyeball it, but of course, we do have this fancy flight computer over here on the side. So we're gonna try to keep things lined up. And we're just gonna go in. Also the game is uh, very helpful. It has a uh, very strong magnets, magnets attached to their uh, docking ports. So uh, when we get in close enough, it will kind of give us a little help out. Oh, we're a little too high. Let's go a little lower. And let's just come on in. Let's see what happens. Feeling lucky. All right. Oh, oh, wait. Too far to the side. Oh, I just turned the lights on accidentally. All right. Oh, let's go a little higher. Angled a little off. All right. I think we're going to do it. Here we go. Hey, we did it! <laughs> we'll turn the thrusters off here. Look at that, a successful docking live on the air. You're welcome, folks. Um, how's that? Uh, I can uh, live stream and pilot spaceships, so uh, <laughs> there you go. Add it to my resume. Well, uh, that uh, was our successful docking, folks, and we can uh, check on our, um, our crew inside. We actually see them in there, our little Kerbals. Uh, they're having a blast floating around in there and we could transfer them, transfer them to this uh, landing module and we could fly this landing module all the way to one of our planet's uh, moons. Uh, this is the planet Kerbin, our fake Earth. Um, but uh, this probably, uh, <laughs> we were probably pretty pressed for time uh, and I'll, I will wait uh, and if, uh, let's see, let's let's check to see. Well, how are we doing on time? Uh, I know I've got uh, I've got uh, a helper watching the stream as well. Uh, if this is probably time to cut things short, then this could be a good time. Uh, if anybody is watching those still, and if you have any last second comments or questions, put those in the comments section, and I will answer them. If you just want to say hi, let me know. Or if you really want me to stick around, excuse me, and we want to try to land this thing on a moon, then I can try to do that as well. Um, hopefully it won't take nearly as long. Uh, probably another... 10 minutes or so. So if you want to see that, then let me know. Um, but uh, uh, I think we might just keep going then. I, I'm, I'm not getting a, I'm not getting a, a negative from my end of things. So we, we'll just keep streaming. I think I might try to land this on the moon. How does that sound, folks? Um, 
All right. Okay. Uh, some uh, so uh, no, we've uh, some viewers are kept coming gone, but we have a few of you still sticking around. If you're still sticking around, uh, let us know in the comments uh, and uh, let me know that you guys are still watching. But uh, we'll just keep streaming. Why not? I'm having fun. Uh, let's try to get this to the moon. So we're going to add another uh, maneuver. And now, right now, we are in low Earth orbit or low Kerbin orbits. And this, since this is the planet Kerbin, uh, and there are different types of orbits. Uh, I had planned this, uh, but I didn't have time to bring it up. Or I didn't think I would have time. So we're going to bring it back up. Um, there are different types of orbits. Let's go over here, actually. Low Earth orbit is um, going to be... Uh, uh, in the real world, about uh, 180 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. And this is where the International Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope, and the majority of uh, satellites exist. Uh, then when you get above about 2,000, we call that the medium Earth orbit zone. Um, and 2,000 all the way up to about um, 35,000 uh, is the, where this zone is. And this is where most of the navigation satellites uh, orbit. A lot of them orbit at about 20,000 kilometers, uh, which means they, which is at an altitude where they orbit uh, the Earth twice every day, so once every 12 hours. Uh, then at exactly 35,786 kilometers is what we call geostationary or orbit. And when you're this high, you're traveling around the Earth at the same speed that the Earth is rotating. So a geostationary satellite is able to look down at the exact same spot at Earth and never move. Satellites that are, that are close to the planet, um, just like our satellite here, will be moving around. As you can see, it's flying over the surface of the Earth. But if you get high enough up to that point, like I said, you were in geostationary orbit, 35,000 kilometers, and the Earth would not appear to be spinning. We would just be facing the Earth and moving around with it. And then there's high Earth orbit, which is beyond that, uh, but it's very expensive and difficult to reach. Uh, so there are very few satellites up there. Occasionally, we will send satellites above geostationary orbit um, to decommission them after they've used up all their fuel. We call that the graveyard orbit. Um, so let's uh, plan on getting to the moon. Now, there are two moons in the system. Uh, there is the Mun, uh, which is uh, sort of the official uh, analog to Earth's moon. It looks a little bit moon-like, but it's actually pretty big and kind of difficult to reach. So we are going to use the easier target, which is the second moon of this fake planet called Minimus. It's an icy little moon, kind of like Pluto, and that is going to be our target. So um, let's... Uh, Let's switch things back over. Whoop. Uh, I'm flying around our solar system here. Ah, that's the sun. Um, okay, there we go. <laughs> so we want to set this little moon as our target. Now we're gonna have to do the same kind of thing we did before, but it's a bigger target, so it should be a lot easier to reach. Um, we are going to first uh, align our inclination uh, with the target, with Minimus. As you can see, our orbit, the blue here is, um, at a very different angle so we want to match the angle first and the best place to do that is at the ascending and descending nodes which are just the the angle point uh, where the two orbits cross paths uh, let's see where are we uh, looks like we're coming up here so I'm gonna add a maneuver here um, and about three minutes and we are going to fire down or upwards which will make our orbit line up a little bit better with our target so we want to line it up Whoop. and you can see right when our nodes switch sides that's when things are lined up all right so that's pretty good and we'll just start with that maneuver just to get things uh lined up so uh basically that maneuver uh, is going to be this blue arrow so we're going to have our flight computer target that maneuver let's check our fuel supply we've got a little bit of mono propellant that was the fuel for those little jets a lot of solid and liquid, or sorry, oxidizer and liquid fuel. A little bit of solid fuel with us still. Oh, I guess that's for the landing module, um, which I haven't tested yet, out yet. Hopefully it works. <laughs> um, it, it will probably land, but as for getting it back uh, home, we'll see about that. Um, all right, so this uh, is going to use a, quite a bit of fuel, about uh, 3,000 or 300 meters per second, but our vessel has uh, a total of uh, 2,500, so we should be good there. Um, so let's go ahead and again, I'm just going to quick save here. <laughs> We're going to fast forward our maneuvers in T minus one minute. So we are going to call this our inclination matching ma uh, maneuver. And, uh, Ooh, it says a 12 minute burn time. That doesn't seem quite right. Um, Ooh, we need to check our staging as well. Uh, because since we, ma since we, uh, connected with this spaceship, 
it's merged our staging. So it would be very bad if we fired our rockets right now. So this rocket we want for later. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, ba -da -ba -da. All of these things. So I believe we want these in their own maneuver and then these in their own maneuver. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's circularize, circularize, not circularize, but let's match our, I'm a little bit late on my maneuver, but that should be okay. So we are going to get our orbit lined up with the moon that we are heading towards. And we are using our fuel here, our Delta V, our fuel budget. But we hopefully have enough brought with us. Almost there. And we can get kind of close. It doesn't have to be super perfect. All right. There we go. I'm going to delete that. Uh, got a couple people still tuning in. James and Donna say, say fun. Thank you so much. Glad you're still watching, guys. Uh, Chris is still watching and would love to see us try to get to the moon. All right, Chris. Let's see what happens. Stephanie says, so much tension. Way to go. Thanks for uh, watching, Stephanie, and uh, rooting for our little, our little Kerbins. Uh, Valentina is piloting us very valiantly. David says, go to the moon. I'm working on it, David. Thanks for still watching. Stephanie says, uh, the challenge is one that we are willing to accept. One that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. I'm thoroughly engaged in this simulation. How, how do you like that? I believe that sounds a bit like a, a quote from a very famous person who made a speech about getting to the moon. Um, all right. So there we go. We've matched our orbits. Uh, now, uh, we have a nice circular orbit, um, but the best place to do a burn is going to be at the uh, lowest point, at your periapsis, uh, and that is um, because of an effect called the Oberth effect, and basically you have the most potential energy when you're closest to the body you're orbiting, and so that's the most efficient time to burn. Um, so we are just going to plan a, a maneuver right here. It's behind us, but since we're in an orbit, we're going to circle back around eventually, and this will give us plenty of time to figure it out. Um, so let's just try this out. We're going to extend, we're going to fire prograde in the direction we are traveling, and that will eventually get us outside of our planet's influence. As you can see here, we reach a point where we will stop orbiting. Now, we don't want to go out into deep space, obviously. We want to intersect with Minimus. Um, and we can see here that our closest approach is actually not too bad right now. So I want this uh, orbit to kind of line up. So if I zoom out here, it's not quite long enough. I want it to intersect close to the moon. There we go. Okay. So the closest approach is about 2,000, 3,000 kilometers. That's pretty good, but we would like to be even closer. We can see it's a little bit too high here. So if I adjust our maneuver um, in a certain direction and uh, I'll be honest, I do a lot of trial and error here. Uh, so again, scientists are going to know a lot more about which exact direction to whoop, point the rocket. Uh, looks like there is an encounter there, uh, but I'm not sure how close it is. So let's try to get it closer. We want to, we don't want to be going too fast, otherwise we'll slingshot past it. Another thing we can do is we can uh, move this maneuver. So I picked a pretty good spot, um, but the moon is orbiting and moving too. So we can actually drag this and move it left and right. Ah, there we go. That looks pretty good. Okay, so the closest approach is a little bit closer maybe. Um, let's keep, ooh, keep adjusting things. <laughs> Too far. We're gonna get this. We're gonna do it. Oh, that's quite an angle. I don't want it to be that much of an angle. How's everybody doing? You guys having a good holiday season, hopefully? <laughs> Let us know in the comments uh, what you want for a holiday gift this year. All right. So basically what this is telling us is we are gonna get within the sphere of influence of the moon uh, and that will uh, let us do some more maneuvering. So um, I think we have enough Delta V. We're just going to kind of eyeball it. So I'm going to save real quick and we're going to call this good. So basically we're going to uh, essentially get close enough to the moon that we will um, 
just sort of get pulled in by his gravity. And we're just going to assume that when we get pulled into his gravity, gravity, we'll be able to plan the rest of our maneuver, okay? We may not have enough fuel to get back home, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. We don't have a ton of Delta V left in this stage, actually. We might... Uh-oh. We might not have uh, enough. Uh, stage 6, 600. Ooh, maybe not quite enough, actually. It's fine. We might have to steal some fuel from uh, the landing module, but that's not... I don't see any issues with that. Um... <laughs> I wonder, uh, there may be, <laughs> there may be a way, uh, to, uh, cheat. Just for the sake of the stream, um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, ah. Oh, did that work? Let's, uh, oh, let's resume. Ah, there we go. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, no, we don't want that. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. Man, I thought we could maybe cheat and give ourselves in infinite fuel, but uh, perhaps not. That's okay. <laughs> We're going to go for it. It'll be fine. Let's fast forward to the maneuver. I think we'll figure it out. I have faith. All right, coming up. Coming up on our maneuver. All right. I'm going to try, I think... Ah, here we go. Infinite propellant. Great. Okay. All right, we've got infinite fuel now. It's not going to be a problem. Okay, let's go to our maneuver node. <laughs> okay. I guess this maybe takes some of the tension away, Stephanie. Sorry. Uh, but I want to make sure you guys uh, have a good time. You know what, though? Let's let's not let's not do that until we need it. Let's let's try to make this work. All right. So we are. Ooh. Ah. Went inside the cockpit. Um, I fired too soon. I want to wait till we are at our maneuver. Okay, so I fired a little bit early because this maneuver is going to take a little bit of time, as you can see. Um, but hopefully this will get us close to the moon. La 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 la. Can't fast forward while we are accelerating that's okay now in the meantime I guess we can transfer uh, let's uh let's go ahead and send uh, Valentina over to the landing module and uh, we'll send uh, Bob down there as well all right just like the Apollo missions there were two astronauts who went down to the moon and one that stayed in the command module Bill is going to be our, or sorry, Bob is going to be our command module person, it looks like. Oh, there we go. We ran out of fuel. Awesome. Uh, you know, we might be able to steal some fuel. Let's, I uh, wonder how I can do that. No, I don't think I can do that. That's fine. All right. <laughs> we are going to cheat. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I didn't plan this out completely. Um, didn't think we'd have time for this, so we are... We are unfortunately going to cheat a little bit. Use the power of unlimited fuel. If I had planned this out a little more carefully, we just needed a tiny bit more fuel to complete this maneuver. But we didn't bring quite enough with us. 
but that is okay. What I did, what I planned, what I didn't account for actually is this, uh, this landing module. Um, because my original plan, woo, uh, was to send one rocket up to the moon, not two. All right. So that, uh, camera shift means we finally left the orbit of our planet. Uh-oh. <laughs> it looks like we, uh, <laughs> Maybe have overshot things a little bit. That's okay. We can plan another maneuver uh, 30 minutes from now uh, to adjust and hopefully come a little bit closer to the moon. All right, there we go. <laughs> Music cuts out. All right, so that should intersect us with the moon. Let's go ahead and point towards the maneuver node. And we're gonna fast forward. We're gonna fly far away from the planet here, out into space. Woo, there we go. And let's just go ahead and fire our engines. Oh, I'm a little too early. Oh, nope. <laughs> oh, now I'm a little too late. <laughs> That's fine. Again, we're doing this live. Okay, we can try to be a little careful here. All right, that's pretty close. Okay, so we should intersect with the moon, and it looks like we are going to slingshot around it, but with infinite fuel, we should be able to uh, counteract that. So we are going to fly fast forward here, and we should see the moon coming up on us. Flying out. Oh, we're getting close. Should be coming up right in front of us. Ooh, there, there it is. Is that it? All right, there we go. We just switched spheres of influence, so now we are being influenced by our little moon here. And again, in the real world, these, uh, this, um, uh, the, there's more of a an, an even a gravitational pull. So you can't, you don't just go straight from the Earth's gravity to the Moon's gravity. You're constantly, being, constantly being pulled by both. Um, all right, so you can see we are traveling really quickly. This is so fast. This is similar to our deep space probes like the Voyager 2 probe, uh, which we uh, talked about a little bit last time. Was that last live stream? Um, and uh, I believe it was, yeah, because we talked about Uranus and Neptune on last uh, week's live stream. Um, but uh, the Voyager 2 probe was traveling so fast it could not stop to orbit those planets when it uh, captured imagery of them. Uh, but with unlimited fuel, we are able to slow ourselves down. So if I, we slow down when we are close to our moon here, uh, then we will be able to get into orbit. So there we go. So it's going to take a lot of delta V. And again, if I had planned this a little better, uh, we wouldn't have to use so much fuel. Um, but there's the moon. In one hour of game time, we'll fast forward through. We will start... Firing to get into orbit. All right, fire engines now. So we're slowing down. We, we are being influenced by the moon's gravity right now, but we're traveling so fast that we wouldn't get pulled into orbit. But if we slow ourselves down, then we will get pulled into orbit. And that's what we're doing right now. And our orbit, our blue line is Right now, going out into deep space, but if we slow down enough, we will get pulled into the gravitational influence of our moon here. Now, this moon is much smaller than the other moon, and both of them are much smaller than the Earth's moon, um, so it'll be a lot easier to land on. We're going to slow our engine down, and we're going to get our periapsis, our closest approach, to a very low point. And we're going to get it... About 20,000 meters. That should be good for now. And now our orbit uh, is very wide. Uh, so it has a very a, a very high eccentricity. And this is the circularness of the orbit. Uh, a perfectly circular orbit is said to have an eccentricity of zero. Uh, and uh, an eccentricity of one is an orbit that goes out into space. So this is somewhere between zero and one. But we can make this orbit circular by doing a maneuver here. Uh, ooh, we want to get rid of this other maneuver. Uh, yep, there we go. 
We would do, uh, add a maneuver here, and so we're going to slow down. We're going to fire our engines again when we are close to the moon, and that will slow us down just like that. So this should be a much easier burn. Let's uh, fast forward again, get ourselves close. Woo! Scooting around. All right, our point uh, retrograde, so we're going to fire our thrusters away from the direction we're moving to slow us down. And this will circularize our orbit, so this will make our orbit into a nice circle. And there we go, look at that. We are now orbiting the moon. And actually, we're coming up on the light side, so I think we should just try to land. Why not? Let's see what happens, folks. Let me quick save again. And... Uh, we're going to go ahead and decouple. So we're going to detach, undock. All right, switch ships here. All right, see you later, Bob. Valentina and Bill are going to go land on the moon. So we want to slow our orbit down even more until it's not in orbit anymore, until it is uh, falling down towards the moon. And to do that, we are going to point retrograde. So let's go ahead and face retrograde here. Now, normally you wouldn't fire fire your engines right next to your other spaceship, uh, but in the interest of time, we're just going to go ahead and do that. So we need to activate them. All right, so you can see our orbit's getting lower and lower. And now it is no longer in orbit. It's going to crash onto the surface of this moon uh, unless we slow ourselves down. And this moon has a very low gravity and no atmosphere, so that should be pretty easy. All right, let's take a look at our rocket here. Now look at our two astronauts in there. They're just having a grand old time, Valentina and Bill, living their best lives. Uh, we should probably go ahead and activate the landing gear on our uh, little lander as well. Let's check our electrical charge. We have a little uh, power supply here, a thermoelectric generator uh, that is giving us juice. Uh, that uh, means we don't need any solar panels, which is very nice. And basically, all we're going to do is we're going to fire retrograde and slow ourselves down uh, until we land. So we can look at our surface velocity. We are traveling 100 meters per second relative to the surface, which is pretty fast and would definitely make us crash. Um, but this moon is so small and there's so little gravity that's going to be very easy to slow ourselves down. So we're just going to fast forward here. And we're pointing retrograde, so our... Uh, stability system is autopiloting, pointing us in the direction that we are uh, falling in that arc as we are traveling downwards. And we can fast forward even more. Our altitude is about 10,000 meters. And we are still traveling pretty fast relative to the surface. But as you can see, it's pretty easy uh, to slow ourselves down, especially with unlimited fuel. Again, apologize for cheating, but that's a great way to make this game more accessible. Um, so you don't have to worry about managing all that stuff. You just want to fly some spaceships. All right, so we are 5,000 meters above the terrain. Ooh, we picked some really terrible terrain to land on. That's all right, give me some kind of challenge. <laughs> um, let's fast forward again. Should probably save real quick. All right should see our shadow somewhere as well all right we are coming in hot we've got to slow down a lot 2,000 meters up shadow where's the where's the sun our shadow should be down there somewhere oop there's our shadow the shadow is very helpful for uh, <laughs> identifying where the ground is and we're coming in 50 meters per second slowing down can see our, our orbital arc is very close to the ground here. All right. Coming in. Hold your breath, everybody. Hopefully there are no uh, 501 alarms or 502 alarms, whatever the... Uh, <laughs> the Eagle Descent Module encounter during Apollo 11. All right, Ooh, we better slow down a lot. Oh, there we go. Valentina and Bill seem very nonplussed by this situation. We're having a grand old time. All right, here we go, we're coming in. Ah, 
too fast. Uh, uh, ah, we did it. Contact light. The eagle has landed, or the the Patrick, whatever we call it. Uh, and I think to round this stream out, uh, we are going to go ahead and plant our flag. So we can EVA. We can take our little Kerbal outside the spaceship, and Valentina is going to be the first Kerbal to walk on the surface of this little tiny moon. And this will bring us close to the conclusion of our stream, folks. Uh, if you have any final comments or questions, put them in the comment section now, because when I plant this flag, we will be coming to a close. So there is Valentina. Valentina, plant that flag. I claim this tiny moon in the name of the Godly Planetarium. Uh, I'm going to name this site. Woo! Uh, and of course, the lighting is terrible, uh, so we're going to take this flag down, and just in the interest of uh, getting a good thumbnail for the YouTube upload, we're going to line this up. So again, final comments, questions in the comment section. Uh, if we, we've still got an audience here. All right, let's try that. It's a little better. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to try one last time. There we go. And maybe it's always going to point that direction. Who knows? Eric says, thank you. Thank you for tuning in, Eric. Thanks for watching. There we go. Woo, landing site. All right. And here we are. We have landed. Woo. Ooh, don't go too far. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Thank you so much again for tuning in, everyone. Chris, uh, thanks for sticking till the end. Uh, you are a true fan. Thank you all so much for uh, staying late for this very lengthy live stream. Hope you enjoyed the stream. And to anybody who's still watching, uh, once again, don't forget, next week's stream has been rescheduled to Sunday night at 8 p.m. where we will be doing a little What's Up live stream, uh, another uh, star tour where we'll be looking at our winter sky, excuse me, our winter night skies. Um, and we will be talking about the Great Conjunction next Monday night, of course, is the night of the conjunction. Don't miss that. Stephanie, thanks for watching to the end as well. You guys are great fans. Uh, and... Um, I really appreciate you guys watching. I had fun tonight. Hope you did too. Uh, and this will bring us to the conclusion. So thank you all again. Uh, I have been your planetarium specialist and rocket pilot, Patrick Hess. Hope you guys enjoyed the stream. We will see you next time on Sunday night uh, at 8 p.m. So thank you. Bye, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>